If you have your Bibles, iPhones, I think some people even carry Bibles these days. Some, I think. I'm not sure. We used to carry Bibles. We don't do that anymore. Now we have, you have your Bible? I mean, oh, we've got some good, some Bibles. Good. Who would think? You know, have a Bible? It's amazing. But we can follow it on our uh, other Bibles and our and the overheads. Kids are going out. For our Jewish holidays, great time to celebrate, remind ourselves what God has done for us. Purim, I just heard some people today, actually this week, someone was telling me about uh, that Purim was one of the biblical feasts of Israel, and I had to correct them. Those of you who know, Purim is not one of the commanded biblical feasts of Israel. The feasts of Israel are found in the book of Leviticus, and God uh, tells us those in uh, order. He tells us it's uh, Shabbat, Passover, first fruits, Shavuot, um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Those are your biblical feasts. Then we have two feasts. I don't say this wrong, but they're man-made. They were commanded by men, but I think God wants us to observe them as well. Those, biblical, those feasts that we find in the Bible are Purim, whole book of Esther, and uh, who commanded us to observe Purim? Anyone? Mordechai. Good. Mordechai and Esther. Right. They, they commanded us to observe this. And then there is Hanukkah. Those are your two feasts that are not found in your biblical uh, thing. Now, there's the Feast of Deliverance. Purim is one of them. Uh, Hanukkah is one. And Passover is one. Uh, so there are certain holidays for certain things. Um, this is a special holiday. Some of you know it's unique. Um, it's found in the book of Esther, and in the book of Esther, it's the, one, it's the only book that doesn't have the name of God in it. So a lot of times people say, well, it can't be from the Lord. But when you trace through it, you see the hand of God throughout the whole book. It's so remarkable to almost like when you look at the nation of Israel, you realize it could not happen on its own. God uh, watched over, preserved our people through the Jewish holiday, and we see the story in the book of Esther. There's something else unique about the, the book of Esther that has nothing to do with anything. It's not important, but I tell you anyway. It's got the longest verse in the Bible. Just those of you who'd like to know, okay? Did anyone want to know that? that fact? No. Longest verse in the Bible, okay? You know, the shortest verse in the Bible, everyone knows that one, right? Nobody? Everybody? Nobody. Okay, Yeshua wept, shortest verse in the Bible. Longest verse, does anyone know where it is? Anyone call it out? Good. Okay, it's Esther 8 and 9. Okay, no spiritual significance, don't worry about it. Okay. The other thing unique about uh, this holiday is the Jewish people read the whole book of Esther. That this week is going to be, they're going to read it. Uh, that's the Megillah, the scroll. That's going to be read to, uh, Wednesday night. Purim, I think it's Thursday, and uh, Thursday morning. They read the whole book, and they go through it. We like to just highlight as we go through the whole book of Esther. If you think of the story of Esther, I want you to think of one verse in the Bible. Everyone follow along. I think we have it up there. No? Do? Yes? No? Good. This summarizes the, really the whole book of uh, Esther. Uh, we read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those, God tells the world. I will bless those who bless my people, who bless you, Abraham, and your people. And the one who curses you, Abraham, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Purim is a story much like Hanukkah, much like Passover, somebody who tried to curse our people. Pharaoh tried it. Antiochus tried it. Haman yeah, you're not there yet, but okay. Okay, uh, they try to curse our people. We see anyone who's ever tried to curse our people, our people survive through pain and anguish. God preserves our people, and we see the others disappear. We have the list. I always read the list. It was Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, the Persians, Greeks, Titus, Crusades, Inquisition, pogroms, Nazis, terrorists, Islam, Arafat, Hitler, stop. Everyone tries to destroy our people, but the Jewish people remain. Now, I've heard, where did I hear it recently? Yeah, I'm watching a series with my wife. But I hear a lot of times, and even in Israel, right outside the wall, there's a, a, a display, 
what is it called, Jerusalem something? Generations, generations, right. And a lot of times our Jewish people in the films in there always say, we made it, Jewish people made it, because we were strong, because we were determined, because we fought, we survived, and it breaks my heart when I hear that. Jewish people survived because of God. God is preserving our people. And that's the story throughout history. God has preserved our people watching over us. Story I like to read. People want to hear it, so I want to read it. But on March 1st, try to get these dates, March 1st, 1953, eight years after the Holocaust, took six million of our people, six and a half million Jewish people. Joseph Stalin unveiled a proposal to liquidate the Jewish people in the Soviet Union. He wanted to destroy another three million eight years after the war. The proposal, he said, was supposed to go into effect on March 9th, eight days after he was presenting this. Um, but all of a sudden, he dropped suddenly and had a stroke and died. But it says, uh, but we continue in the, in the story here, it says, on March 1st, when he unleashed his plan, 1953, at noon, Stalin called a meeting of the Politburo uh, Polit in the Kremlin to read to the Soviet leaders his plan to exterminate the three million more Jewish people. This was his plan. He said, I'm going to, there was a bit, this is what he's making believe. He said there's going to be a sudden, sudden plot against himself, Disco, uh, discovered to kill him. It was a devious and clever plot, he says, planned by doctors, all of whom happened to be Jewish. He was going to destroy and kill all these, uh, the Jewish doctors. Then what he was going to do is going to get all the other Jewish people in Russia, all the rest of the people. He says, the Jews will be placed on special railroad cars sent to far north and Siberia plains. However, only a third of them will reach their destination. His two-thirds will be, fall victim in each of the towns to the anger of the people, and they will kill the Jewish people along the way. According to the librarian, now he's presenting this to his uh, leadership. And he says, according to the librarian, when Stalin finished reading the proposal, there was dead silence in his room. And uh, Stalin was furious, cursed his cabinet member, cursed the people, slammed the door, walked out. His plan proposed March 1st. On the next day, the plan was supposed to go into effect one week later. March 2nd, the next day, after outlining his plans exactly one week before the extermination of the three million Jewish people were going to take place, Stalin died of a stroke. He lay in state for a week, and then he was buried on March 9th, which happened to be the day of Purim. You can't rise up against the Jewish people. You will not survive. Then there's another thing I like to read. Some people don't like that. I read. After getting nailed by a cluster bomb, Osama who is long gone now, made his way to the pearly gates. There he was greeted by George Washington. How dare you attack the nation I helped conceive, yells Mr. Washington, slapping Osama in the face. Patrick Henry comes up behind him. You wanted to end the Americans' liberty, so they gave you death. Henry punches Osama in the nose. James Madison comes up next and says, this is why I allowed for the federal government to provide for the common defense. He delivers a devastating kick to Osama's knee. Osama is subject to similar beatings from John Randolph of Roanoke, James Monroe, and 65 other uh, who have the same love for liberty and America. As he rides there on pain on the ground. Uh, where was it? Yeah. Thomas Jefferson picks him up, hurls him back to the gate uh, where he's to be judged. Osama waits the journey to his final, very hot destination. He screams, this is not what I was promised. An angel replies to him, I told you there would be 72 Virginians waiting for you. What did you think I said? Okay, so we'll finish that. I just like, I like to read that at Purim. Those who curse our people, God will curse. Those who bless our people, God promises to bless. When you think of Purim, I like you to think of words. You can jot them down. Uh, God's promise, God's faithfulness, God's deliverance, God's control. I like the word sovereign, which I'll explain in a minute. 
God reversing the curse. So, if you have outlines, this is what I like you to think on for him. Because God is sovereign. Now here at Shuv, everyone knows what the word sovereign means. Sovereign means God does what he wants, when he wants, the way he wants, without checking with us. God is in complete control. Because he's sovereign and faithful and in control, we should therefore serve him and tr trust him and serve him with our lives. Purim, the study of a story of God's faithfulness. Very, very quickly, if you have your outlines, historical background to the story. You should know this. The historical, the historical background, Jewish people were, well, there was once a nation of Israel, a whole nation. God cut it in half, made two nations out of it, the north, the south, Israel, Judah. That happened somewhere around the year 930 BCE. The kingdom was cut in half, and for the next couple hundred years, there were two nations. The north, they were taken captive in 722 BC, about 200 years later. The south and Judah, they lived for another 130, 140 years in the south until Babylon Nebuchadnezzar took them captive as well. He took them captive to a foreign land, uh, Babylon. He took them there for a number of years, and they were in captivity. At the end of that time, Nebuch well, Nebuchadnezzar is gone, but there was a king by the name of Cyrus who sent the Jewish people back to Israel. Now, the background of Purim is that the Jewish people came back to the land of Israel. Cyrus brought them back to the land of Israel. When they came back to the land of Israel, somewhere, my wife hates when I mention dates, so, but some of you like dates, anyway. They came back, I'm just saying, somewhere around the year 520, 540 BCE. They came back. The government in Israel is always three. You should remember uh, three forms of government in Israel. The, the prophet, the priest, and the king. That's how you, you look at the government in Israel. When the Jewish people came back to their own land, they were a sovereign nation. They didn't have a king, but they had a governor now. His name, it's not important, was Zerubbabel. They had a priest by the name of Joshua. And they had a pro two prophets at that time, Haggai and Zechariah. That's around the years, we'll just say 520 to 540 BCE. Now, a hundred years after, now, that's the condition of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. A hundred years later, the condition, we have a condition in the land of Israel again. We have again a king or a governor by the name, it's a hundred years later, by the name of uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is your leader in the land. The uh, priest at that time would be Ezra, and the uh, prophet at that time would be Malachi. Now, the reason I tell you that is in the land of Israel, when they came back, we see how God was blessing his people, taking care of them. A hundred years later, we see how God is taking care of his people in the land again. But the question for the book of Esther and the holiday of Purim is this. How was God taking care of his people who never came back to the land, who never came back to Israel, who stayed in uh, Sushan, who stayed in Babylon, who didn't come back? Is God still preserving them, not in the land? Does God only take care of his people in the land? So the book of Esther is somewhere between those hundred years, between 540 and 440, somewhere in the middle there. We see the story of Esther and Purim. Jewish community, Jewish life in a foreign land. How God was preserving his people. That's the background to the story. Life for the Jewish people outside of Israel. So the story of Purim, what I like to do is, we, we could read it, but we'll be here forever and you've heard it enough. So I like to summarize a little bit. And so I put it out there for chapters for you to look and so you could read it as well. But I'll just summarize, if I can, briefly, each chapter. Follow along in your outlines. Chapter 1, I put three words there. There's a banquet. It starts off with a banquet. After the banquet, we see there's a problem. And then there's a solution. Chapter 1, I'm just summarizing. Banquet. The king, the king tells us, just follow the first one. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia. It tells us the next couple of verses, he threw a banquet. First he displayed his glory for six months. Then he showed, had a special, special banquet feast for a week. They were glorious in the kingdom. As he was doing this, there developed a problem. The king decided he was drunk and, he had, and all his people were there, so he wanted to display his wife, Vashti, before all the people. Now, it doesn't tell us in the Bible. There is a tradition that tells us he wanted her to be, be, appear before all the people to show her beauty. 
Some tradition tells us he didn't want her wearing anything at all except her crown. She refuses. There's the problem. You can't refuse the king. And so we see here the problem. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Queen Vashti, she also gave a banquet for the women in the place uh, which belonged to uh, palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. He commanded her, verse 11, to bring the queen, Vashti, to him. Verse 12, but she refused. Chapter 1, banquet, she refused. Solution, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, it tells us, if it please the king, let a royal edict be issued by him and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media that she should not come anymore uh, before the king. Vashti should no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus. Chapter 1, pretty basic. Chapter 2, write these words down. There's a contest. It begins in verse 1. After these things, the anger of King Ahasuerus subsided, and he remembered Vashti, what she had done, how he would have been decreed against her. She was taken out, uh, out of the kingdom. So there was a contest. Let's have a Miss Susa contest. In chapter 2, there's a big contest. And they bring these beautiful young women before the king for a, a long period of time. And they were going to have a contest, and they were going to select one. Chapter 2 is the, uh, what did I put here? What's the word? The contest, right. The, con the contest. There's the results of the contest. Follow along. In chapter 2, verse 7, it tells us, Mordechai, Thank you, okay. He was bringing up Hadassah. That is Esther. Good, okay. That's all you're going to get. For she had no father and mother. And so she appeared before the king. And it tells us in uh, chapter 2, verse um, 15, 16, 17, she found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. There was a contest. Lovely queen Esther. She won. It says... The king loved Esther more than all the women. She found favor and kindness with him more than all the other virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashdod. She won the contest. Now, I, one of my favorite couple verses is actually, it's a side conversation in chapter 2. It's really, really, it is so God's in control, God's sovereign. Chapter 2 is really over, except if you're having a, sh uh, a play or so, you picture a city, and here's a, 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 a big wall, and on the other side of the wall is two men having a conversation. These two men are angry at the king, and they say, we're going to kill the king. It just fits out of nowhere. It appears, the conversation. Meanwhile, on this side of the wall, listening to this conversation is Mordecai. Okay, he hears it. He hears it. Sends back word to the king, and these two men are found to be guilty, and they're, they're killed, they're, they're hanged at that time. The end is chapter 2. Now, chapter 3 begins, fill it in chapter 3. There's a promotion, there's a plan, and there's a proclamation. The promotion, who saved the king? Everyone. Yeah, no, I, no, 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 no. You said it, I, I cheer now, okay. Who saved the king? Yay! Okay, that's my friend. Okay, he saved the king. He should have been promoted. But the promotion goes to a wicked man. No, I didn't say his name. You can't yell like that. Okay, the promotion, chapter one, uh, I'm sorry, chapter three, uh, where were we? Yeah, verse two. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. Thank you. So the king had commanded concerning him that, but Mordechai refused to bow down. So chapter, uh, chapter 3 here, he's promoted and he gets angry and jealous of good man Mordechai. So he makes a plan, all of chapter 3. The plan is he draws lots. The, the word for that is poor. Puts them all in a hat. And if I could make it in modern terms, we'll just put, he puts 12 months in a hat and all the days, and he picks out of the hat. And it just so happens, if it's like he's doing it in January, he picks out the poor, the lot, and it says December on a certain date. And his plan is on that date, we're going to destroy and kill all the Jewish people in that area, all of them. And so that's his plan. 
And so they're rejoicing. He's made this great plan. He's promoted. There's a great plan. And so, and they make the proclamation go throughout all the land. Chapter 4, one of the great chapters, 4, 5, and 6. Chapter 4, write these words down. There's a plea, plea, he's begging. Mordechai, in chapter 4, says to lovely Queen Esther, you have to go before the king and save us. Lovely Queen Esther says, I can't. He's angry. He's in his throne room. He's been there for a month. He hasn't called for anyone. I can't go. He's there. He hasn't even asked for me. If I go, I will die if he doesn't hold out the golden scepter. So we're summarizing chapter 4. It says, so there's a plea. Good man says to her, you must go. She says, but I can't. He gives a challenge. You must. She answers back, okay, I will. So that summarizes chapter 4. But I want you to see in his challenge, verse 3, the great theological uh, verses, verse 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine you, lovely queen, in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jewish people. Then this man, he knew his theology. He knew his promise from God. Verse 14. If you, lovely queen, say silent at this time, relief and deliverance for our people will come from another place. He knew God's promise to his people that God would always prefer, uh, pro provide and protect our people. Another place. And you and your father's house, you will all perish. Who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. You see, there's an amazing theological principle there. If people say, if you don't go and share your faith, if you don't uh, do what God asked you to do, it won't be done. Listen carefully. That's not true. If you don't share your faith, if you don't do what God wants, God will still accomplish His perfect will without you and someone else. But you will suffer. You, know, you can't fight against God. It's going to get done, so you might as well serve him. So this great man told her, but God has raised you up for this special time. You think you won that contest on your own? You didn't win that. And then she says, she responds, great. Then the lovely woman told the good man, go assemble all the Jewish people who are found in Susa. Fast for me, don't drink. Eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I, my maidens, we will fast... Uh, Fast in the same way, and I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. I will serve the Lord no matter what. Chapter 5. It gets interesting here. Verse Chapter 5, there's favor. She wins favor. She's going to go into the throne room. There's a great banquet. Oh, I want to tell you about that banquet in a minute. And there's great pride in this chapter. Chapter 5, she decides, lovely queen, to go into the throne room before the king. And it tells us, chapter 5, verse 2. When the king saw lovely queen standing in the court, she obtained favor. He extended to Esther. Caught you off guard. The golden scepter which was in his hand. So she came near and touched the top. Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? How in the world would you come in here and take your life in your hands? What's your request? Even to have for the kingdom. And then she, I don't know if she had it planned or if she maybe a little scared to try, but she said, if it please the king and wicked man, Haman, you can't say boo until I say Haman. Okay, good. Come to the banquet. She understands how to get to a man. It's his tummy. Anyway, and, she, and they went to the drink, uh, and they drank, and their wine at the banquet. Now, I happen to know what was at that banquet meal. It's not in the Bible. I found out. I did a lot of research. And I found out what was in the banquet. Really. First of all, they had, which is a shame, they had bad wine. It was called, this thing called Manischewitz. It was really, really bad. Really bad. The king said to lovely queen, what is this? You're, she said, don't worry about it. Anyway, but, but then, then she brought out Elsie's chicken soup. Before the king. He says, what is this? It's a special soup just for you, king. Then they brought out Fran's brisket. <laughs> then they brought out uh, this thing called kasha and bow ties. And the king never saw anything like this. 
And, and they, then they brought out Elsie's Kugel. And they had all kinds, of, then they brought this thing out called Simis, and they had, then they brought out this special bread that the king never had before, and she they found out that it was special Jewish bread called challah. Then they brought out rugula, and they brought out this whole meal. But everything, everything with Jewish was made with chicken fat. It didn't sit well in his stomach. But he liked the meal. It was very, very good. And so they had a special banquet this night. And it says, they ate and drank. And then he says, what's your petition? For it shall be granted you up to half the kingdom. So she replied. And she said, my request, my petition, king, is... Come tomorrow night. I'll give you another meal you won't believe. I don't know if she was planning it or not. And then it says, if I found favor, king, if it please you, grant my petition, come tomorrow night. You and wicked Haman, come to the banquet which I prepared for you tomorrow, and I will do as the king says. Now at this point, the banquet's over, everyone's happy, the king's happy, wicked, wicked man is happy, Esther's very content, Esther, go. All right, and wicked man goes out, full, enjoying but as he's walking along the street, everyone's bowing down to him the way they're supposed to, except good man. Mordecai. He stands tall. This man's pride can't handle it. And he says, Then wicked man went out that day, glad and pleased of heart. But when wicked man saw good man at the king's gate, that he didn't stand up, he didn't tremble, wicked man got angry against good man. Haman he's got to be better. Controlled himself, however, went to his house, told his wife and his friends what was happening. Then wicked man recounted all the glory of his riches and everything. He says, I have so much. I got ten kids. I got a wonderful wife. I got so much good. I'm the second in the command. I have got so... But it's that Jewish guy. He gets under my... You know, I know, every time I see him standing, I can't handle it. So his wife, Zara, says, no problem. Let's solve the problem. And she's going to solve the problem. Uh, And she says in verse 12, uh, even Esther, she invited me on to the banquet, yet all this doesn't satisfy me. Then her solution, uh, Zeresh in verse 14, chapter 5. His wife and his friend said, this is no problem. Have a gallows built. And it says, 50 cubes, about 75 feet in the air. Have the gallows built, made in the morning, and in the morning, go ask the king to hang Mordechai. Yeah, you can't say yay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hang him. Go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased him. So he went to sleep. Curtain goes down. Now, if you could see the screen, it's a movie. You see four different people preparing for the next morning. The end of chapter, what was it, chapter five? Yeah. Next, they're, you see Mordechai. He's praying. You see Esther. She's cleaning up. Now she's got servants. But anyway, she's supervising everything. You see, wicked man, Haman, looking out his window, and what does he see being built? 75 feet in the air, the rope is swinging. He's happy. And then you see, who else is left? Oh, the king. Oh, yeah, the king. He's tossing and turning. Oh, man, what they have in that food. So he's got indigestion. He's not feeling well. This is the scene, the end of chapter 5. So chapter 6 opens up. This king, is, he's having a rough night. And, and it tells us, chapter 6, he's sleepless. Chapter 6, sleepless and reverse. It says, during the night, the king couldn't sleep. So he gave an order to bring in the records, <coughs> the chronicles, as they were read before the king. When you can't sleep, I tell people a lot of times, especially as we age a little bit, some of us have trouble sleeping. Some of us. I know young people, they don't know what we're talking about. But some of us have trouble sleeping. So I always tell you, at this point, I can cure your insomnia. Any of you older people who have insomnia, I can cure it. I really can. This is what you do. You get up, it's hard. You go into your some room, you pull out the Bible, and you open up to Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. No one in the world can make it through the leprosy laws. I remember when I first tried this, I remember there were about 50, 60 verses of mold on the house. 
and inflammation in your scalp and leprosy. And I remember reading through, and about verse 20, I started yawning. You're not going to make it through the leprosy laws. Now, if you have a bad case of insomnia, <clears throat> you turn to the second half of Exodus. And unless you're a carpenter, you're not going to get through that either. Two by fours and veils and arcs and uh, covenants and cherubim and uh, uh, utensils. It, it's hard. But if you have the worst case of insomnia, the worst case, you turn to Second Chronicles. Oh, no, I'm sorry, First Chronicles. Eight chapters. So and so begat. So and so begat. So you can't make it through First Chronicles. Um, it's so difficult. So this king says, bring the chronicles in. You'll read it to me, and I will fall asleep. So that's the background here, chapter 6. So they bring in the records, the chronicles. They place it before uh, the king. And when it was found, they start reading. What, play, what did they read? The conversation back in chapter 2. The two men were trying to kill you, king. And the king's about, he's about to fall asleep. Whoa, whoa, two men were trying to kill me? Yeah. What happened? Well, there was this Jewish guy named Mordechai. He heard. I don't know if they said Jewish. Uh, he heard that they were trying to kill you. He said, what happened? We investigated. We destroyed the two men. He said, what honor did I give to that young that man? They said, nothing. Instead, you promoted Haman. They didn't say that. I just added that. So all of a sudden, it's in the early in the morning, the king says, quick, get me some. Who's in the court? Well, you know who got up nice and early? Wicked man. He came to ask the king to kill Mordechai and hang him on the gallows. So he's coming in cheerfully. And it says in chapter uh, 6, verse 3, the king says, What honor and dignity was bestowed on Mordechai? The king's servant said to him, Nothing was done. So the king said, who's, who's outside? Who's in the court? Now, a wicked man had just entered into the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak it to the king about hanging good man on the gallows which he had prepared. The king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman is standing outside of the court. And the king says, Let him in. And he says, what should, what should be done for the man I want to honor? So wicked man goes, Who's he mean? It's got to be me. He says, I know what I'll tell you to do, king. If you really want to honor someone, this is what you do. Have him ride on your horse. The king said, sounds pretty good. Have the horse have your crown. Put your coat on your cloak on him. Have him ride through the streets and then find another very important official and saying, this is the man you want to honor. The king says, that's great, wicked man. And he says, go and do right now for Mordecai. He was surprised. And it says, um, verse 7, then wicked man says to the king, for the man you want to honor, have him wear a royal robe, have the horse which you've ridden on, and a royal crown placed on his head, and then lead him through the square. And so he says, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, then the king wick answers wicked man, quick, take the robes, the horse, and the crown, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who was sitting at the gate, do not fall short in anything. So wicked man took the robe and did all that. Now, he takes him throughout the street the whole day. And then he quit. Remember, it's the second day for the banquet. So after he takes Mordecai through the street, he rushes home. And his wife Zara says, well, did you hang him high? Did you have the king hang Mordecai? And wicked man says to his wife, Zara, you don't know what happened today. You have no clue. He says this. Wicked man recounted to Zeresh, his wife, verse 13, and his friends what had happened. Then the wise men, I love this phrase, and his, uh, Zeresh, his wife, said, uh-oh, if Mordechai, before whom you began to fall, is of Jewish origin, you are in trouble. You will not overcome him, but surely you will fall before him. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs quickly arrived, and brought wicked man to the banquet and had, that Esther had prepared. End of chapter 6. Great reversal. Chapter 7, basically, and I'll summarize the end. The chapter 7 is the second banquet and his downfall. We begin chapter 7 with the banquet, and it says, And the king says to lovely queen on the second day, What's your petition? And uh, Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, 
And it pleased the king, let my life be given to me as my petition and my people as my request. For we have been sold and I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, annihilated. Now if we had only been sold as slaves, I wouldn't bother you. Then King Ahasuerus said to the queen, who is he, where is he, who would presume to do this? And Esther says at the second banquet, a foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then he became terrified. And finally, the end of the chapter, he is destroyed and he is swinging. You see, God reverses the curse. And wicked man is swinging at the end. Chapter 8, I'll just uh, give you the words. Chapter 8, good man Mordecai was honored and lifted up at that point. He was honored. His plan was, on that day when the Jewish people will be destroyed, let our people be able, given the king's weapons, the king's men, let them uh, defend themselves. And that was their plan. And there was great joy in chapter 8. Finally, chapter 9, they were delivered, the Jewish people were delivered. And it says in chapter 9, verse 5, the Jewish people struck all their enemies with a sword, killing and destroying them. And they did uh, what they pleased to those who had hated them. They were delivered and Purim was instituted in chapter 9, verse 22. Because on those days, the Jewish people rid themselves of their enemies. And it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning to a holiday, that they should make these days of feasting and rejoicing, sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. They established and made Purim. And in chapter 10, Mordecai is exalted and made great. Basically the story. Let me quickly summarize a couple lessons you've learned from Purim. One, God is sovereign and in control of the details of our life. He's, con he's in control of the whole book of Esther, and God is trying to tell you and me, He is in control of all the details of our life. No matter what you're going through today, God is still in control. As you serve Him, love Him, worship Him, live your life for Him, God is in control. When we go through the, the, the book, an overheard conversation around the wall. The king's favor to lovely queen. The sleepless night. God could even put you to sleep or keep you awake. The delayed requests. Um, the great arrival of the wicked man. The Bible tells us the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it any way he wants. God is in complete control. Psalm 135. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in all the heavens and the earth, in the seas and in all deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings forth, from the wind, from, uh, forth the wind from his treasure. God is in complete control of all the details. One of my favorite stories, there's a great book called O Jerusalem. Um, o Jerusalem is the story of how Israel became a nation. It opens up with a vote on, I think it's November 29th, in the United Nations for the partition plan for the Jewish people uh, to have their own land. The United Nations is trying to decide. The British man, the British was in charge, and they gave it over to the UN, and they were going to decide, does Israel become a nation? On that, on that day, they decided for a partition. Jewish people have a land, and the Arabs will have a land. They were partitioning up Israel. In the next six months, the whole world was trying to think, maybe it's not wise. Maybe we shouldn't have a partition plan. Maybe we realize that we should just give it all to the Arabs. The Jewish people don't deserve their land. In the next six months, there was a tremendous wave to take away the land from Israel. And the people were saying, they were watching the United States. They were watching our president what would he say? President Truman. Most people don't realize the government, the United States, and uh, Truman, and all Jewish people were favoring not to give the Jewish people the land. They were favoring to take back partition. And the Jewish people said, we must get to President Truman. But President Truman said he doesn't want to hear anything about Israel. 
He doesn't want to hear anything about partition. He's closed his mind. There's too much fighting and killing between the Arabs and the Jewish people. He wants nothing to do with it. Israel was lost in hope. They said, we must get to Truman, but we can't. And all of a sudden, they said, we want this Jewish man by the name of Weitzman. Chaim Weitzman? The, the first president of Israel. Weitzman, uh, he invented, discovered, invented TNT for World War I. And he was, he was a British citizen, and they wanted him to get to President Truman. But he couldn't get there. Truman didn't want him. But Truman had a policy. Truman's policy was any of his old friends who were part of the army that he was in World War I. He also had a haberdashery store, and he had a partner by the name of Eddie Jacobson. Eddie Jacobson was nothing. Just a haberdashery guy. But he had an open policy the president, that Eddie Jacobson, whenever he wanted, could walk into the Oval Office and see the president. It was his friend. So the Jewish community got to Eddie Jacobson and said to Eddie Jacobson, you must get into the president and tell the president he must talk to Weitzman about this. They said, Eddie Jacobson, you must do it. So Eddie Jacobson walks into the president's office. It's a great, great story. He walks into the president's office and the president looks at Eddie Jacobson, Eddie Jacobson looks at him, Eddie Jacobson starts to cry. Very Jewish, Jew Jewish guilt. And the president looks at him and says, no, I don't want to hear about it. You don't want to hear anything about the, the problem. No, Eddie, don't do it. And Eddie comes in and he says, but my people. No, don't go there. I don't want to hear anything. I picture this poor, poor Jewish man. I'm Weitzman. I picture this. He has no home to go to. Finally, the president relented and he said, all right, let the man come in. I'll give him one hour. Chaim Weitzman came in. History was written. At the end of the hour, Truman reversed his whole position. Truman and the United States were the first ones to recognize Israel. A few, less than a minute or so after they declared they were a nation. God turns the heart of the king. He has the heart of the, in his hand turns it any way he wants. Truman eventually was said to, he said, maybe I'm the modern day Cyrus who's going to bring the Jewish people back to the land. God is in control of everything, folks. That's what the book is all about. Second, God is faithful to all his promises. He will keep his promises. He promised to protect our Jewish people, to preserve us and watch over them. Nothing can stop it, no matter how bleak it looks. Third, God, you, we can trust him with the details of our life. God is in complete control. I think of Fran and I back in 1996. I was about almost 50 years old. Fran and I, we, used to, we loved where we were living in Jersey. And Fran used to say, where would you like to retire? 50 was a little young, but we were thinking about it. And we retired at that point. And we said, we'd like to retire in Livingston, New Jersey. It's nice here. We like it here. God is in control of all the details of our... We like it here. Then something happened. A lot of things happened. You don't need to know the details. And then one day, I was losing my home, my kids in school, my congregation, my friends, everything. And I was sitting... It was December 1995, sitting at my desk with my hands closed. And in my hands was my home, was my congregation, was the kids in believing school, was my life. And God said to me, open your fists. I said, but Lord, open your hands and give it all to me, you can trust me. I'm 50 years old. Open your hands. And at my desk, I remember that December, I opened my hands. You know, I can't describe it. Some people don't, my friends don't believe it. The moment I opened the hands, I was free. The Lord told me nothing. He didn't want to tell me, I'm taking you from Jersey to California. You think you want to know God's will? Believe me, you don't. 
You want to serve him and let him work out the details. For me, my life was just beginning when he moved me to California at the age of 50. It was just beginning. But I had complete trust. The moment I opened the hands, he said, I will take care of all the details of your life. And I knew it without having any answers. You could, that's the story of Esther. God's in control. He's faithful to your, his promises. Actually, there was a verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Can you go back to that verse in Job? Verse in Job? No, one more. It's back the other way. Ah, one of my favorite verses. Memorize it. Learn it. It's great. Whether for correction or for God's world or because of God's loving kindness. Read it. He causes it to happen. God is in control. Romans 8, 28. For, God causes, for we know that God causes all things to work together for his good. God, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, God works all details. And finally, last lesson in Purim. We have a responsibility to God. Everyone look up here. You know I divide the world into two groups of people. The right bubble, that's all believers. The left bubble, all non-believers. Both have a responsibility to God. The right bubble, us believers, this is in the story. The right bubble, we have a responsibility. And it says, chapter 4, verse 14, if you remain silent at this time, God will accomplish his will without you. But who knows whether God has not brought you for such a time as this. We must worship God. We must serve Him. We must live our lives for Him. We must read the Word. We must pray. God is in control. We have a responsibility. The left bubble, non-believers, they have a responsibility. Today, I'm not saying these are bad people and those are good people. People in the left bubble are Jewish Gentile people that have never received Yeshua. They're good people. They've never received Yeshua. People in the right bubble, good people, bad people, they've accepted Messiah into their heart and life. The people over here in the left bubble, they have a responsibility to God. Just like in the story of Esther, the Jewish people were promised deliverance on the day of Purim. You know what the Jewish people had to do, though, for that deliverance, everyone? It tells us they had to rise up and defend themselves. And God would save them. The Bible tells us, those in the left here, those who are non-believers, God has granted you salvation. God has granted you forgiveness of sins. But you must do something. You must accept God's offer. You must accept God's Messiah. You must accept God's atonement. You must accept God's forgiveness which only comes through Yeshua, the Messiah. The Bible tells us that. Look, look at the, in these verses. John chapter 8. Yeshua says to them, unless you believe that I, uh, unless, therefore I said, you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. But as many as received the Messiah, Yeshua, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I close with a little story here. Jewish community, right here, talking to Yeshua the Messiah, here. The Jewish community says to Yeshua, it's in the Bible, what must we do to do the works of God? What must we do? They're asking Yeshua. What must we do to please God? What must we do to earn favor with God? What kind of work must we do? The book of John tells us. Yeshua turns to the Jewish people and says, this is the work of God. Here it is. That you believe on him whom God has sent. All God asks for you to do is Tell God you believe, he, you believe you've sinned against him. Second, he sent Yeshua to die in your place. Third, put your trust in his death, in his atonement. Accept him as your Messiah and Savior. 
Father God, we thank you for the story of Purim. We thank you that you delivered our people long ago from the wicked man. And you had our people saved and delivered. Today we thank you for the message in the scriptures that teaches us the Messiah came as promised for our people. And that all those who put their trust in him have eternal life. My prayer today is that anyone here today who's never accepted Yeshua into their heart, that they might simply say three things. One, God, I believe I've sinned against you. Two, I believe you sent Yeshua to die for my sins. And three, I want to put my trust in him. I believe in him. I receive him as my Messiah and Savior. We thank you for this Jewish, Jewish holiday of Purim all speaking about your deliverance, for we ask all in Yeshua's name. Amen. Hi, I'm Rabbi Larry Feldman from Shuva Yisrael in Irvine, California. Click here on the Round Shuva logo to subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss a Shuva video. Toda B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach.